Hi, welcome and thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program and Future Tense for this discussion of Rachel Aviv's beautiful, beautiful book, Strangers to Ourselves, Unsettled Minds and the Stories That Make Us. I'm Larissa McFarker, a 2018 Emerson Collective Fellow. Um, before we start, a few housekeeping notes. First of all, if you have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function and we will get to them in the second half of the event. Roughly like the last 15 minutes will be audience Q&A. Um, and most importantly, copies of Strangers to Ourselves are available for purchase through our bookselling partner, Solid State Books. And you can find a link to buy the book on, the, on this page, just click buy the book. And I really, really urge you to do so. It's, it's one of the best books I've ever read. Um, so Rachel Aviv is a staff writer at The New Yorker. Uh, where she writes about medicine, education, criminal justice, and other subjects. In 2022, she won a National Magazine Award for profile writing. A 2019 National Fellow at New America, she received a Wedding Creative Nonfiction Grant to support her work on Strangers to Ourselves. Um, so welcome, Rachel. Thank you for- Thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> thank you for being part of this. Um, so. I want to begin at the beginning of your book. You open it with a story about yourself as a child, and you're coming to realize that your life could have turned out very differently. Um, and I, want, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about that experience and how it led to you writing this book. Um, well, it had been this kind of like episode in my life um, that I didn't quite know how to like categorize or what to do with it. It just felt like this like freakish thing that had happened to me. And um, just to summarize quickly, when, when I was six, um, my parents were getting divorced and I stopped eating for a couple of days and my mom took me to the pa pediatrician. And it just sort of escalated very quickly where the pediatrician said, oh, this is anorexia because she's not eating. And it was the late eighties when anorexia was just like in the cultural consciousness as this new threatening thing. Um, and then I was put in a hospital. And once I was in the hospital, like the behaviors sort of got worse. And I think one of the reasons why is because I was surrounded by these amazing older girls and I sort of saw them as mentor figures and wanted to be liked by them. And I had this kind of like strange disperse behavior and it they kind of helped me like channel it into a more recognizable form of illness um, whereas before maybe my behavior was like an expression of anger or helplessness or something but it like it wasn't organized and when I was in the hospital it became organized um, and then I think I really wasn't thinking that much about this moment in my life um, in a way that I found interesting until I was writing a story for The New Yorker um, in I think it was 2017. And I wrote about these children in Sweden who suddenly lost the ability to talk and move and they stopped eating. And this all happened when their families would be denied asylum to Sweden. Um, they were refugees there. And I think I just, there was something that resonated with me about like a child who displayed some sort of behavior of protest uh, but in a but their social and cultural context kind of like changes the way that behavior is interpreted and because the behavior the interpretation changes the behavior can also change so I became interested in that kind of like interactive dynamic between a person's identity and the diagnosis or the way that they're behavior has been categorized is that yeah well I mean reading about you as a six-year-old and these older girls who um you know one thing that became really clear to me and you do say this in the book is that um your ignorance was protective the fact that you were six and had never heard of anorexia could barely pronounce it didn't understand at all the cultural meaning of it or what you were supposed to be doing was very protective of you, whether, whereas the older girls, and I would say also um, Laura, another person you write about in another chapter, their psychiatric sophistication um, sort of made them worse. And so I was wondering if 
you know, there's so now even more than the eighties, the uh, stories about mental illness and, and sophisticated understandings of mental illness are so omnipresent. And I was wondering if you think that's doing us harm. I mean, I think that is a really interesting question. Like I, I, I feel like people have asked me a lot about TikTok, which I don't know that much about, but like this, this idea of like having some behavior and then like finding a community. And I guess what I feel is that like, it's not predictable. And I think there has been an assumption that it's always good. It is always good to talk about mental illness, to identify it, to label it. It will always reduce stigma. And that's just sort of something we take for granted. And I guess I think that in many cases, it probably still is very good to talk about these things. Um, but like, we don't actually, I think we think about talking about it as like a neutral thing. Like um, we're just describing what is. And I think I was interested in the fact that like talking about mental illness isn't always neutral. Like it actually changes the behavior itself. And sometimes it reinforces or exacerbates that behavior. Um, and I think we kind of know that with suicide, like suicide is one area in mental health where I think people don't take that kind of like approach of the more we talk about it, the better. Um, like we're sensitive that suicide can be contagious, that suicide can be something that once someone thinks about it kind of takes root in them. Um, but I wonder if we've like carved out suicide as the exception without thinking about the ways that there are parallels with other sorts of illnesses. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, along the same lines, um, one thing you you talk about quite a bit is is the idea of insight and the role that insight plays in the way that doctors evaluate their patients. And at one point you said um, it became apparent that gaining insight into interpersonal conflicts, though intellectually rewarding, did not provide a cure. And this was startling to me. Um, I. It sounds as though, perhaps because of, of, of psychopharmacology, that insight has gone completely out of fashion. And I was wondering if you could just, um, I mean, of course, there's there yeah. are now and have always been different schools of thought on this um, within psychiatry. Could you say something about what you discovered about insight and how it how it's viewed now as opposed to in in, let's say, 50 years ago? I think the insight is still seen as a valuable thing, but it's like what it means to be insightful has changed a lot. Um, and it is like there, it's sad to think about. I mean, the idea that like, if you just understand what caused your problems, you'll get better is just like so wonderful. Like I can see why that would be like this amazing organizing principle for a field of psychiatry. And I still think like, um, I don't think anyone's like thrown out that idea, but I think people saw, I think it was like this, moment of disenchantment to see that someone, you know, was in therapy for nine years and not improving and they take a medication and they suddenly improve. And like, you can sort of say, oh, well, the therapy like prepared them to enter that state. But I think ultimately, like there had to be a recognition that, um, you know, that, that the insights were, were pretty limited in terms of how it was changing someone's life. Um, but I think like now insight is used in this more descriptive way, which is like, if it's some, if someone comes into a hospital and they're displaying all this strange behavior and the psychiatrist says like, you have bipolar disorder. And the person says, no, I don't like, I am actually just like an incredibly talented poet who can like speak the truth. And I'm speaking the truth. Like that person might be seen as not insightful. Um, and I mean, that that wasn't a great example, but I think like where it becomes more difficult is when someone is, you know, like in the chapter about Naomi, who was this woman who came in and, and felt like she had just discovered like how racism had shaped her life and her children's life. And she really wanted to talk about that. And so when she would talk about that with her psychiatrists, they felt like she was, um, sort of putting the emphasis on the wrong issue. The right issue was that she had bipolar disorder and that was why her life was, you know, going off the rails. And when they would tell her that for her, it was alienating and sort of proof that she shouldn't trust the doctors because they weren't actually like hearing the problem that she said was causing her suffering. So I think like insight is interesting to me in part because it's one of those rare concepts that like 
brings together the gap between how a person is describing their distress versus like the theories that are supposed to explain their distress or the explanations. And it's like insight sort of measures that match. Like does the person's own explanation match the sort of expert explanation? I mean, that uh, I'm torn between asking you to talk more about Naomi and, and, and I mean, just to, th that, 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 that discrepancy comes up in every one of your stories. Um, but I wonder if you could just um, talk about Ray first, because I mean, you know, he, you put him at the beginning of your book because uh, his case sort of lays out the battle within psychiatry that is still going on to some extent, though in some ways one side is one. Could you just tell us about him and why his case was so important and how it sort of is resonating even now? Well, I had seen references to his case like for the last maybe 15 years. And it was always this thing of like Ray Osheroff's case proved, kind of proved that, that, that it was medical malpractice if a doctor denied a patient medication. And so he'd been treated at this really famous psychoanalytic institute, Chestnut Lodge. And he was getting worse and worse. And he was a good, yes. what you you like when this was taking place. Oh, sorry, good point. Uh, this was in 1979. So it was like the heyday of like believing it that like if you just talk to someone and like hear, you really understand them. You, they always make sense. Like this belief that like, no matter how so sick someone is, you can reach them if you just listen and you'll sort of reach a kind of mutual understanding. And so he went to this place and he kept talking and talking about all the things that had made him depressed because he was a doctor and he sort of, his marriage wasn't working and he felt like estranged from his children. And Chestnut Lodge felt like he needed to sort of work on his personality and work on his relationship with people and when he asked for medication, they felt like it was a way of sort of skirting like the real fundamental issues that he wasn't addressing. And finally, his mother pulled him out of the hospital and sent him to a different hospital where he got medication. And like, it was just this incredible metamorphosis where suddenly he was like a funny, sensitive man who, who could function in the world and who sort of could appreciate life. And so then he was so angry that he'd been like denied that treatment that he sued Chestnut Lodge. And I thought that the story was like, that was the most frustrating chapter to write. Um, in part because, you know, I, I thought it was like important in terms of the ideas, like these, um, you know, the, these two dominant models in psychiatry colliding and the sense that one had to win. And then when I read Ray, Ray had kept this, these diaries and he had written a memoir um, that was never published. And when I read the drafts of his memoir, I just was really aware of how, um, how even though he thought that his story was supposed to be like an illustration of the triumph of bi biological psychiatry, it just wasn't. Um, but he, what was so frustrating to me is that I also wondered if it was like his personality that had made him, that had made the psychoanalysts not know what to do with him, that like they just didn't like him. And so they had these like beautiful theories, but when it came down to it, like they didn't want to apply those beautiful theories to someone who was so annoying. <laughs> um, yeah, he is extremely annoying, I have to say. Um, I'm thankful that you read his memoir so we don't have to. Um, but there, there, I mean, along those same lines, uh, you you quote another um, psychiatrist, Clerman, um, this great phrase that I love, pharmacological Calvinism. Um, I wonder if you could explain what that was and, and why it exerted a pull on people. And then I, I was also wondering to what extent it has a pull on you. Yeah, no, I think it's like such a good word because I feel it even today. But I think at the time he was saying, like, we need to get rid of this suspicion that if you're using medication, it somehow is a sign that you'll you haven't done like the good hard thing. You've taken the cheap out and you'll have to pay for it somehow. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's like a, a persistent thought. And I don't, I think I'm torn between feeling there has to be something valuable about like figuring things out on your own and like 
fixing one's problems through like thinking and analysis and communication as opposed to like there is something about taking a pill that feels so easy that I think that yeah, he articulated something that like really um it like speaks yeah it speaks to me you know even now I mean you you talk about about uh, your experience and that of many of your friends taking Lexapro and that everyone, I think everyone um, feels the, feels dissatisfied with being on it, even if it's having right. wholly benign effects. And I was wondering if you could think about that a bit, like, wh like why does everyone seem to feel the need to dial off a medication if it's making their lives better? I mean, so I wrote about my friend, Helen, who at, at the time that I went on Lexapro, she went on it too. We were both like having amazing conversations, like just enjoying life so much. And then she was like, this is fake. This is inauthentic. I don't think she's a writer. She didn't think she would write as well without it. And so she stopped the Lexapro. And then she like read the section of my book about us and was like, what is wrong with me? Like, why, why did I deprive <laughs> myself of this? Um, but I don't know. I, I also like, I don't, I think that we don't actually know like how it's changed our sex lives. Like, I think that that is something that's like this weird missing piece in conversations about medications that I just think it's interesting that it is so often, um, you know, women, particularly white women who take these kinds of SSRIs and that they're sort of seen as risk-free, but they actually do have like a profound effect on people's sex lives. And it's interesting to me that somehow that's not seen as like a profound side effect. Um, it's kind of like, whatever, there's no risk, but, but like maybe there's a failure to sort of think about people's relationship with sexuality as much as sort of seriously as might be good. I don't know. Um, because I don't think, like, I feel fairly confident that I'll just like keep staying on Lexapro, but I, but I almost don't think about the sexual aspect of it. And I think that is real. That's, that is really different. Interesting. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's almost as though in penance for psychoanalysis is uh, you know, by stereotype obsession with sex, that sex was the root of everything, mm -hmm. uh, that now this field has swung all the way in the other direction and is like, well, who cares about sex as long as your career is going well? Right, as long as you can have a family and a career. And like that, those are the advertisements for SSRIs. It's like these women who have their kids and their wedding ring and like they're wearing a work suit. Um, and it's true, like it does, it, it does make, I feel that it allows people to like manage those conflicting sort of obligations or desires better, um, but it kind of, and I don't think it speaks just to psychiatry. I think it also speaks to like, um, I remember right. Alan Francis saying like, he could never understand that when the new generation of SSRIs, Alan Francis was like helped write the, one of the earlier versions of the DSM. And he said that, when the new antidepressants, the SSRIs replaced the previous generation, everyone was like, these are amazing. There's no side effects. And he felt like, what does that say about our culture that like this really extreme side effect is just like, no one really cares to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that could be a whole other book. Um, <laughs> um, well, another really interesting thing that I had never heard um, before I read your book um, was, I mean, the thing that I'd always heard was that um, when biochemical explanations for mental illness became preeminent over uh, psychological ones, that one of the things that people said about that was that it would reduce stigma, that it wasn't, you know, both stigma of you, like it's not you being lazy or feckless or something, and also towards your family, like it's not the refrigerator mother anymore who's causing your illness, it's, it's just the chemicals in your brain. That part I'd heard, but what, what I'd never heard before is you said that um, that the effect of this explanation has been different for different kinds of patients. So whereas with rich white patients like your character, Laura, it is experienced as a reduction in stigma with 
Uh, you quote an anthropologist who's worked with poor black and brown patients. And she finds, I think it's a woman, that yeah. um, like, like your character, Naomi, that this is not at all welcomed as an explanation of what they're going through and they experience it very differently. Could you, could you say a bit about that? I think what, you know, the way that she put it was first that she noticed that when she's an anthropologist, but also a psychiatrist. And she said that when she talks to patients and they're able to sort of say like, I'm so unhappy. I'm so sort of this mentally disorganized right now because of the way I grew up and because of the like lack of support in my community. And like that, that is very empowering and healing for them. Maybe in the same way that someone used to say like, I'm so upset because my mother was like toxic and dysfunctional, but like, she's basically saying that to deprive, to sort of tell someone whose life has been shaped by all these really like cruel, oppressive forces, that it's just in your biology, that you're not responding to all the things that have happened to you, that is diminishing. Um, and that yes, for like someone like Laura, who really didn't have any like discernible conflict in her life that feels very visible. Um, then she feels it's not her own fault. But like for someone like Naomi, who grew up in a public housing complex and poverty, like with lots of violence all around her, to be told that, you know, it's just in her body is sort of really denying her reality, which is that like all of these stressors sort of put her on the edge. Um. I want to ask you more about um, Naomi uh, in a second, but um, I just want to remind everyone listening to this that um, you should be thinking, if you want to, about questions to ask um, to ask Rachel because we're going to go to questions in about like twenty minutes or so. Um, I did. I'll say one more thing just yeah, to not yeah. really simplify it. Like I feel like with Laura, the the woman she went to Harvard, she grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. Like because there was nothing like clearly wrong in her life. Um, it was easier for her doctors to to not see like the, the various things that were a cause of great discomfort and to sort of say it was biology where she too might have like understood more about herself if she could talk about all the ways in which like she did feel uncomfortable at Harvard even though it like you know one her doctors because of their own cultural background probably felt like you know why would anyone feel uncomfortable there it's it's wonderful for her but like she felt like it had to be within her, it had to be her biology because her life was like visibly perfect. Right, right, right. Well, so tell, can you talk a bit about um, Naomi and I mean, one of the, both about the, the terrible things that happened to her in her life and also about the way, the bind that she found herself in when on the one hand, her explanation, her psychiatrists dismissed her explanations for her distress, and then in in court, those yeah. explanations proved overly powerful. Um, yeah, could you just uh, ex say a bit yeah. about her story? So she was a um, a single mother of four kids by the time she was twenty four, and she kind of started reading about the history of. Black people in America and, and like having she started having this awakening that like her whole life had been shaped by discrimination and racism and that her kids were going to grow up in this sort of trap that she had grown up in and she became more and more psychotic and went to a bridge and jumped off with her children thinking that like some sort of evil government force was going to get her and one of the ch child children died um and one was saved and when she was in the hospital, um, she basically talked about how she had reached this point where she kind of understood what life would look like for her children. And that's why she did what she did. Um, and when she was evaluated to see if she was competent to stand trial, they said she was, that she couldn't plead insanity because like, her, her sociological insights were true. Like what she was seeing about her environment, they understood to be true. So they were like, she can't be insane. And I think like the irony is that before she committed her crime, she was sort of saying those same things, um, but her doctors weren't really engaging with those things at that time. At that time they were like, why aren't you understanding your bipolar? Like you need to recognize your bipolar. And then there was this shift where like, suddenly the truth of what she was saying felt so prominent that she couldn't possibly be insane. Yeah, uh, an amazing bind. Um, 
So with Naomi's case, her account of her unhappiness is clearly reality-based. Um, another one of the stories, um, an incredibly moving story in your book, it's really harder to figure out mm -hmm. what is real, what isn't real, or do those words even make any sense? So, um, I mean, you know what I'm going to say, like, uh, yeah. so there's always been a kind of uh, entangling between religious experience and uh, what's called mental illness by other people. You know, there's, there's even with anorexia um, in both in medieval times and in the 19th century, um, there's been widespread in instances of women uh, fasting, which is interpreted religiously. And then in other contexts, it's interpreted psychiatrically. And, you know, it's, it's, very common uh, manifestation of, of what's called by psychiatrists schizophrenia that that people will talk with God or even imagine that they are God or related to God. I wonder if you could um, talk a bit about Bapu and how you understand her life, how how you entangle a uh, disentangle religious experience from psychiatric category, and does it even make sense to try to do that? Yeah, I think I like landed on this in the space of like not want, not trying to disentangle them because it's like every time I would talk to one of her family members, their approach, well, I'll, I'll just start summarize. Should I summarize? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about who she is. So she um, was living in Chennai in the sixties and she became a young mother. And after she had these two kids, she was, she was living in this like large um, Brahmin family and there were a lot of pressures on her and she started retreating to her prayer room and becoming increasingly spiritual to the point, like at first people really thought she had this gift and they, she wrote this incredible poetry and it was like celebrated as a sign of sort of communicating with God. But then like she went too far kind of for her family and started running away to healing temples. And then they would like drag her back with police vans and she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and it sort of this pattern of running away from home to these healing temples where she was embraced as a kind of mystic persisted for like 10 or 15 years. Um, and when I talked to, I talked to her two daughters, uh, two children a lot, one was the daughter, one was the son, and they had such different views of what she had been through and it sort of structured their lives around like their interpretation of their mother's life. Like, um, the son had become very religious and felt like he was almost like continuing her legacy as a person who had access to the divine and his daughter and her daughter had become like a mental health activist who is arguing for a more complicated way of understanding mental illness but but fundamentally like couldn't have memories of her mother like starving and and being dirty and, and really unhealthy. And to her, like that was such a expression of disability that she couldn't say like my mother was, you know, with God in those moments, like that, like her mother was actually suffering. So I think she came to the space of feeling like it didn't really matter what, what she was calling it, but like she, her mother was suffering and therefore that's why she needed like medical help. And what, how do you think about it? Like which, when you're talking to those two children, who do you find yourself uh, agreeing I, with? Or do you agree with both of them or, or how do you think about it? Well, I'm like skeptical of my own biases. So I guess I try to like, like my bias would be like, I don't have a spiritual relation. I don't have like a spirituality um, as a profoundly unspiritual person, uh, I guess. I'm more like, I don't even know what to do with the spiritual understanding, except for like, feel there's something to be honored about it and like, sort of feel in awe of the way in which it can structure people's lives. Um, so I guess I'd, I, I was thinking about this. I was like reading, for some reason, I was reading your Amazon page of your book. <laughs> and, um, and it said like, you're very non-judgmental. And I was thinking, because a lot of people have asked me like why I'm non-judgmental, but I almost feel like in this story, uh, I, I truly didn't have like a secret feeling about it. Like I, I really, 
every time I would talk to someone, my understanding of the situation would change, except for the fact that I have like a built-in difficulty understanding, like getting my head inside the mind of spirituality. Like I can only see it from afar. Um, I think your, your story makes it so clear that to ask the question, is this spirituality or is this mental illness? It's the wrong question. Like there is no answer. There's no, you know, nothing depends on, on answering it correctly because it's, it's, it's the wrong question. I I think, I mean, that's. Uh, And I think that like, I guess why the reason why I think it's the wrong question is because it assumes that there's like one explanation or one model that will be like the healing model. And I think it was clear to me, Bapu's story and other people's stories too, that like they were able to hold different explanations at the same time, like numerous explanations at the same time, like um, sort of shifting between explanations or even, you know, simultaneously having multiple explanations. And I don't know, I think like it's a weird impulse that we have that you have to choose one um, that like, and in the, at the end of her life, Bapu took medications while like furiously writing to um, deities. And so like, she was able to sort of straddle both worlds without getting so like pulled out of them that, you know, I think the thing that her daughter said was that when she was at her like most, I guess, sick would be the word, like she wasn't the thing she wanted in life, like to have a family, she was no longer having a family. She like had abandoned them. So I, I guess like in this very practical way, that feels like a sign of sickness to sort of feel, to deny yourself of like the thing that for you is like constitutive of a good life. Huh. Cause that's interesting. Cause I, I didn't get that from your story that she wanted a family. I mean, I think what I got was that once she had children, she loved them and, and missed them when she was away from them, but that the desire to have a family was never, it didn't seem to be one of her goals. In life. Sorry. I think that's the wrong, I use the wrong word, not family, but that like being away from her children was a source of grief, like a right. life of grief. No, the family was like the baggage that she didn't want, but it was. Right. Um, so, so in that chapter, you quote this um, Indian psychiatrist of the 19, I think 1960s, uh, N.C. Surya, um, saying that he didn't accept the Western notion of mental health as a kind of statistical norm because Indian healing cultures were meant to raise the self to a higher ideal. Like the goal is not to be normal. The goal is to be better than normal, um, detached, spontaneous, free of ego, rather than simply to restore the person to a baseline of normality. And Surya ended up quitting psychiatry, you said, and and entering an ashram. And I was struck by that because in the context of Bapu's story, his notion of mental health as a kind of aspirational um, idea is more capacious than the Western notion, but it's also much more demanding and kind of um, punitive is the wrong word, but, but demanding. And I was wondering how you thought about that as, as what you, in, in having written that chapter, how you think about the Western notion of mental health as being more or less normal, like, like other people. Like something you said that I think is really interesting is, yeah, it is more punitive. It is more demanding. It is more aspirational, that model. But I also think like so much of mental illness is that sense of um, purposelessness, aimlessness, sort of lostness, um, like not knowing where you position yourself. And so there is something very appealing about, even if it's punitive, and maybe this is like the sort of anorexic kind of approach to mental health, but there is, you know, I I can see why, like, just aspiring to be healthy is like, so um, there's something deflating about it, you know, like, and then what, and then what do you do with your life? Like, how do you fill your days? Um, And I think um, treatment is focused on like getting rid of symptoms, but like, then what? And I, and I think that there are these dynamics where people get rid of their symptoms and their life feels sort of like they're living in a you know group home and they're taking their medications and they're like working a menial job, but like actually they look back on their moments of psychosis and they felt like they were touching something, like reaching for something. And no matter how like detached from reality that was, maybe there is a nostalgia for that. 
yeah, I mean, I guess that's the sort of function of a religious tradition is to unify um, the quest for health and also self-perfection, whereas in sort of ordinary Western psychiatry, there's sort of two stages. Like first you just get to be healthy and your health is merely a tool for you to accomplish other things that have yeah. no relationship. Like, like the perfection of your mind is not really, it would probably, uh, you know, if someone went into a psychiatrist's office and said, I, I want to perfect my, myself, um, that would probably be taken as a symptom in, in itself. Right actually love a system that like told me how to do that like that sounds so the way you're describing it because then I do think you kind of like you have sort of like the SSRI ads like you can achieve these like two categories your work or your family but like there's still so much missing in between well so again on this theme of um of of how culture affects um a sense of mental health mental illness um you write, culture shapes the scripts that expressions of distress will follow. And, um, you know, I love the work of Ian Hacking, who you quote, and I would, I would love you to uh, say something about him. But, but so what, I'm, what I was going to ask you about that quote that I just read is, do you mean that mental distress is a kind of universal substrate that kind of takes a form depending on the repertoire of understandings available to the person in their time and place? Um, or is it more murky than that? I mean, another way of, of asking the same question is, is um, I don't know if it still aspires to do this, but at the time of the, the sort of DSM-3, psychiatry was aspiring, though not achieving yet, to carve nature at its joints. You know, the yeah. ultimate goal, which it was not uh, claiming to have achieved, was to find the sort of real dividing lines between mental illnesses in the way that, um, you know, medical doctors or other kinds of doctors could determine that something was either due to the heart or due to the lungs, but not get confused between the two. Um, so I guess I was, I was, the question is like, whether you think that, um, that, that discovering such carving nature at its joints is, is in theory possible with mental illness? Or do you think that cultural difference goes all the way down? That it doesn't, again, make sense to ask, um, you know, is this a uh, thing that appears in another culture really schizophrenia or really depression or, you know? I mean, I think it's striking that like that, that task of like carving nature at its joints for mental illness, it's now been 50 years that scientists have been trying to do that. And so like, I, I can't speak to whether like that's an attainable goal, but like the fact that 50 years have been so many resources have devote, been devoted towards that goal. And I imagine like those resources are taken away from thinking also about, um, you know, I like, I like the way you said it like that, that substrate of like mental distress and there are probably like various categories of that substrate, but then there is that interactive process where um, you're sort of the way you're expressing illness or whatever it is, is like read by your community. And once it's read and interpreted by your community, it sort of puts you on a certain path because you're responding to that too. And like, I think even to, um, to feel like seen is really validated. So like if if you need to sort of make some adjustments so you fit that classification better and then you're sort of seen by your doctors as a more legible person that needs help, I, I could see the, how those shifts happen. And I don't, um, yeah, I don't, like I, I definitely don't mean to say that it's not also like real biological illness, but just that like we don't think as much about that um, sort of interactive dynamic that takes place once there's a sort of an explanation or a story for that illness. Well, the fact that you just used the word story reminds me that I, I, I feel like I've neglected one of the core. Is, of the book. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> don't, which is that, um, you know, you say that there are some stories that free us and some stories that trap us. And that one of the things I love about this book is that way it's so, nuanced, it's neither an anti-psychiatry book saying that diagnoses are, are traps and boxes and, you know, et cetera, or, nor is it, uh, you know, psychiatrists are wonderful, wise people here to help us. And they, they're 
their their t- treatments can only do us good. Can you say something about the way that um, our experience of distress is shaped by stories available to us and then how those stories can then become identities and start to trap us possibly? Um, yeah, and I guess stories was the word I came to because like I couldn't find the right word for what it is, but like that moment where you like, your illness sort of, you weave like a narrative into like this illness sort of is going to determine my, like this, this idea that like you get a diagnosis and it starts to shape your sense of your own possibilities. And it maybe starts to shape other people's understanding of sort of who you are and like um, what you might do with your life. And I think, um, then I also was interested in like the story that psychiatry has told over all these years in the sense that like, um, that there can only be one story at a given time. I don't know if I'm totally answering your question, but like, I also think then there were all these stories that people were telling about themselves, like through their own writing, like many of the people that I wrote about were so invested in kind of like articulating what they had been through in the moment, maybe because there was this feeling of like, I think um, it's easy to like lose access to your own understanding of the experience once like someone else's interpretation has been placed on it and you sort of don't trust yourself as um, like an authority on that experience. Yeah, Um, I mean, well, okay, I'm gonna, (laughs) I wanna talk with you so much more about this, but, um, I want to transition now to audience questions because I'm looking at the document and see that there are a lot of great questions um, here. So, um, and again, reminder, uh, it's not too late to submit a question if you want to. Um, So the first question is uh, from Kam Kidia, who is a, I hope I pronounced that correctly, 2023 fellow uh, at New America. He says, with Bapu, you allude to the role of colonialism and epistemic violence in shaping our stories of mental illness. Can you talk a little bit more about this link? I mean, it was just so striking in India um, that like the entire mental health system there was a sort of British, a product of um, colonial rule. And I think like it was such an early instance of sort of transplanting British ideas of the self onto other people, that there was this like sense that someone in a, this this like a quickness to pathologize expressions of religion and maybe a um, failure to like appreciate that India had developed this like really robust way of understanding mental health. And those kinds of strategies for a really long time were just like not seen as scientific and legitimate. Um, And so I think even in Bapu's life, the idea that like she could go for the, she could run away to a healing temple or she could be like behind bars in a hospital. um, There was sort of no possibility of those, of like those methods intermingling. And one of the interesting, well, one yeah. of the interesting things that you point out is that Bapu herself had a critique of that was sort of um, of Indian psychiatry directly, which is that if she had been a man, those same behaviors would not have been pathologized in the same way. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I was like shocked I, when I interviewed her psychiatrist. He was really old, like 88. Um, but he just had su- and he was he was a Catholic Indian psychiatry psychiatrist. So he had like an interesting background, but he was just so dismissive. He like showed me really proudly. There was this plastic bag. He'd like taken off all the charms and talismans that his patients had come in wearing. And he was like, I take them off and I show them like, if they're in this situation and they don't need these. And he just, it was like this like joyful sense of like, I am showing them what the truth is. And this stuff didn't work. That was really shocking. Um, An anonymous question. Um, Can you talk more about your experience covering resignation syndrome? What advice would you have for people who write or read about culture bound phenomena? I mean, I was interested in when I I would interview doctors, 
the idea of suggesting that an illness, like, I think it's interesting that to tell someone an illness is cultural is seen as like such an insult. Um, like that was, and, and I never would have said that, but like, even when I would ask questions about like, it's interesting that every, the most of the patients who have resignation syndrome know someone who also had resignation syndrome. And there was this like, sort of, I felt like that was a taboo question and like seen as a sort of anti-science question, the idea that there was cultural influence. Um, so wait, and I don't know if there's something I could say more about like the experience of writing about it, but just that maybe like not, um, it definitely was a conscious of not asking questions that implied that like the question, the reality of someone's illness. And I, and I guess I didn't feel it was ever necessary. Like I can, I could ask them if it's what they make of the fact that like multiple people know each other who have the illness, but I don't think I was, I think like even talking about illness, any kind of illness, like there is just this really like sensitivity about the idea that it's not like concrete and true. And as if like, it makes such a difference, whether it's like, I don't know. I, I, it's interesting to me that there is like such a distinction between something that's like real or not real, even though either way, like the person is totally suffering and like needing help. And as though, as you yourself pointed out with suicide, um, suicide is very much one, yeah. one person influencing another and no one thinks it's not real. Yeah, um, it kind of reminds me of like uh, this Indian psychiatrist I interviewed who said like it really bothered him when people would say like praying is not a biological and is, is a placebo effect. It's not like a real intervention because he's like everything you do affects your biology. So why is this like any less real than, you know, putting something into your body? Like it's still affecting your body. Another question from um, and this is from uh, Roxana Asgarian. Reading your thoughts on how il illness and identity interplay, I wondered about your thoughts on the explosion of trauma theory in the public consciousness. I mean, I would love to, I find that so interesting and I've like always been looking for a way to write about that actually. Um, like I just interesting to me that, and I don't know what Roxana means by, like maybe uh, there's something specific you're thinking about with trauma theory. I guess I'm like speaking more generally about like how trauma has been like turned into this like object that like it's become so um I mean even like yeah, proving one's trauma or sort of in order to get like sometimes it's like there's a very real need like in order to get asylum you need to like show that you were traumatized but it's taken on this meaning um that I that feels like it's become more concrete than maybe like, I, I don't know what, what it actually means. Um, I actually would love to hear what Roxana thinks, but I, I, like, it's something that I've thought about, but I don't have like a coherent thoughts, except that I think there's something weird going on with like the way that word has sort of become like the ultimate proof of wrong done. Um, a question from Anonymous. Um, and actually I, I'm glad that uh, anonymous asked this question because I was going to ask the same thing. Um, can you talk about how the structure of the book came together? Um, I mean, you and I have yeah, talked yeah. at length about like, you know, many stories versus one story, you know, how you put them together. I'd love to hear what you have to say about how you made it, that decision. I mean, that part felt so hard to me because I, I never had those concerns. Like I could just write a story and it could have its own point or ideas and I didn't have to think about how it related to other stories and I think um it I know that my editor had said early on that like I should think of the book as a prism and so like you're asking a series of questions and if you look at those questions from different angles you'll come to different answers and like that and then I think at some point I also started to be aware of the idea that like one of the freedoms of writing a book versus writing a story for the New Yorker, for instance, is that like when you're writing a story, you're picking this one person's story as representative of a larger theme or problem. And like, you know, that in doing that, it's not like fair. Like it's, it's just, you're leaving out like so many different stories that probably conflict with that story. Um, and so I liked, I, 
there was something nice, like when I realized at some point that like each chapter, it was supposed to build on the previous chapter, but it could also like throw the previous chapter into some degree of doubt. So like that there could be a way in which like a reader could feel destabilized. Like I, okay, I, I finished this chapter and I have this sense of how to answer these questions. And then you go to the next chapter and you're like, well, maybe I was like too quick to reach that previous conclusion. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I wanted, I wanted the, like the ideas to, I think the, the thing that my editor had said that was useful is like thinking of the ideas as a kind of character that like evolves from one chapter to the next. Um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about this a lot more too, because it was like a source of a lot of confusion and like retrying, trying things out and them not working. Well, can I ask you, I mean, a, a sort of follow-up on that is like, I mean, having read your book, twice now, I, I feel like it couldn't have had any other form that this is definitely the best structure for it. But um, you wrote at some point in the book that at some point or other, you considered making each of the stories that comprised your chapters, the whole book, the whole book about that person. And I was wondering if you could just t tell about, talk about that decision and what would have been gained by making a book by writing a book only about one of these stories and what would have been lost? We know what would have been lost because you just explained, but what would have been gained? Um, thank you for reading it twice, by the way. Um, but, uh, um, well, actually, if I write another book, I definitely want to just do one story. Like that would, that would be just so much more pleasing in a lot of different ways. Why? But, Why? Um, because then there's like so much less pressure to, I, I think like there's, I think there's almost never, it's very hard to find a story, I think, that like merits that length. I did think Naomi, like about telling Naomi's story as a book, but it wouldn't have been, it would have been about mental health, but it would also have been about um, like the child welfare system and the way that it had shaped like three generations of her family. And so I guess it would have been a, a different story. And that was the one that I really, like I liked the idea of taking one person's story and then like branching out on different, like showing different family members and how they sort of interpreted things differently. Um, wait, so yeah, how did I decide? No, I think that was more like, I, I find it so hard to know, to ever feel like, I just never wanted it to feel like I was blowing up a person's story to be at like some length. This allowed me to feel like the story was at the length. Um, I don't know, but I also felt like I couldn't really like say the things I wanted to say about mental health if I just told one story. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, well, you mentioned uh, a future book. Uh, this is our next question from Katya Savchuk, who says, you've written about many fascinating subjects. Have you been tempted to expand any of your past articles into books and how have you decided whether to do so? I... Um, I think it's only when there's like strands that I could keep following, but I find it very hard to know like what, first I find it really hard to come up with ideas that like, uh, ideas. And second, I find it hard to know, to me, the idea of like, I think about Random Family by Adrienne Nicole LeBlanc as this like perfect example of something that justifies a book. Like it's just, there would be no way to tell that story without a book. And I guess the question I always have is like, is there a way to tell that story in a shorter length? And if so, like, um, wouldn't that be the, the better thing to do? But maybe that's like some, some stupid sort of magazine um, brain internalization that I'm doing. Um, so one, I think one last question. Um, one of the things I found fascinating was that you wrote about how this is, this is I, I hope, a historical uh, note of yours, um, that Western psychiatrists uh, historically associated mental illness with civilization and thought that people who lived in less civilized societies would not become mentally ill. And I wondered if there is any trace of that crazy idea still left, if there's any sense as you read in sort of 19th century, early 20th century novels that like mental illness could be thought of as a sign of sensitivity and refinement. I mean, I think so. I think there's a sense of like, even in the, some of the stigma 
that like the sort of psychiatry's failure to engage. I mean, I think like the legacy of feeling like people who are not civilized don't, the psychiatry is like a field for the civilized and the refined. And I think that legacy has shaped like both the stigma against using psychiatry, like the fact that they would make assumptions like this. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of like a specific example, but it feels like a, a like stereotype that is still alive that like um, the psychiatry likes a certain kind of patient who will be like, who has certain ways of telling stories and, and like sort of doesn't know how to deal with people who tell their story in language or in kind of using tropes that like don't conform to this very like overly internalized um, I don't know, there's just such a certain type of a psychiatric patient that it does make you question, like, why has a whole field been built so much around this one type of person? Yeah. Um, I wish we could talk for so much longer, and I hope we will get together and be able to do so um, soon. But uh, we're out of time. And so thank you so much, Rachel. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone for joining us. And um, just another reminder to do buy this book. It is truly an extraordinary book and really you should read it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.